Thank you, Robert. It is a pleasure to be here with you. It's always a joy to be in Texas. I actually uh, gave a big talk at the State Bar of Texas uh, when we launched the book back in, in June and had a wonderful reception. So it was, it's a real joy to be batting clean up here, your last speaker for the year. Hope you enjoy this. So I'm gonna talk about North Carolina. Uh, there's a place um, down east in North Carolina. I call it hog country. For those of you who have never been there, it's about halfway between the capital city of Raleigh up here and the glittering coastline that's justly famous for the Outer Banks. It is a world of sandy loam soil and country roads that wind away through the forest and these gorgeous loblolly and longleaf pine trees seem like they've been there for an eternity. It's also home to more than 2,000 of these guys. These are large-scale industrial hog operations. Here's how one of these things works. This is a fairly small hog operation, just three barns. So hogs are inside. They stand on concrete. They never see the sunlight. They never touch the ground. They never see the dirt. Remember this, there is no dirt inside a hog operation. You'll see why I said that in a minute. They grow super fast to their uh, slaughter of 250 to 300 pounds on a very uh, a fast diet. Um, they produce an enormous amount of waste, and ultimately that's what we're going to talk about here and, and why I called the book Wastelands. If you've got 1,200 of these in a barn, you're producing the waste of a town of 6,000 people every single day. And if you have multiple barns, that 5x multiplier adds up quite quickly, you're talking about a city of 20,000. Or if you have 10 barns, that's a city of 50,000 people. It's pretty uh, straightforward what happens. The hogs do their business, the slats are cut into the concrete, falls down and collects in a pit, and occasionally, once every week or so, it gets slushed out into this open air pit that is really a cesspool, although the industry calls it a lagoon. Each one of them holds between six and eight million gallons of hog waste, and that's the equivalent of 30 water towers of a quarter million gallons, or it's also the equivalent of 10 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Now, I mentioned that that animation was a small hog farm. Here's a large one. So there are quite a few of these. I took these shots, actually, from a small plane flying at about 1,000 feet, there are places in Magnolia, in Duplin County, the very heart of hog country, the most dense, or the densest population of hogs in the world, where you can be at 1,000 feet and see nothing from horizon to horizon other than hogs and hog farms. So the industry solved the waste problem initially by saying, well, we'll get backhoes, we'll dig big pits in, in the earth, and we'll just basically contain it all in these open air lagoons. But what happens when the lagoon reaches its capacity? Because constantly, the hogs are coming and going, and they're producing waste. Obviously, you have a finite volume in these cesspools. Well, the industry decided that they would come up with a really low-tech solution, which was to create a Jurassic-sized lawn sprinkler and shoot it out onto the fields. Now, there were a lot of fields that they could do this to. And initially, initially it seemed like a really reasonable solution. I mean, waste is a fertilizer, so if you shoot it out onto a field, you could potentially grow some stuff. Well, you see here that they're not really growing anything but wildflowers. A lot of the spray fields just get, uh, they're basically plowed dirt. There are some that grow row crops, but for the most part, there is very low utility in, in this highly concentrated hog waste. Now, hog country, down east, in eastern North Carolina, it is the remnants of an ancient sea. Uh, it is the coastal plain of North Carolina, very fertile soil. It was not always this way. It was not always dominated by the industry. It was for more than 200 years, the Brightleaf Tobacco Belt. This is the world that King Tobacco built until about the 1950s when tobacco hit an economic slide and a lot of the tobacco farmers had an existential question. How do we keep our family farms when we can no longer make money, uh, or at least no longer clear, uh, hit our bottom line with tobacco? 
They looked around. Many of them sold out, uh, tried to diversify, you know, and, and ultimately had to close down. And others, others looked for a savior. And one came along by the name of Wendell Murphy. Wendell Murphy was a hometown uh, boy made good. He was from the small town of Rose Hill and built the largest feed mill, uh, and still is the largest feed mill, called The Chief in this little town. He had diversified himself, gotten into the hog business back when they were raised on the ground, not in barns. And then one day he had a cholera sweep through his herd. And by government regulation, he had to euthanize all of his animals and quarantine the dirt. Now, a lot of people might have thought at that moment, well, that was a bad venture. I'm going to get out, go back to the feed mill. But Wendell actually had an idea. And it was, and I have to say, just brilliant. It was to do with hogs what Don Tyson had already done with chickens, which is to say, I own the animals, but I'm going to get somebody else to raise them. And I'm going to pay them a guaranteed stipend on the back end for every live animal I can take to the slaughterhouse. And I'm going to take the risk of the fluctuating market, and I'm going to give them the guarantee. And so the day Wendell Murphy handed out his first hog contract to former tobacco farmers to grow hogs on their land was the day that the modern hog industry was born. For virtually everyone in eastern North Carolina, he was considered a savior. He is still to this day in his 80s the godfather of the modern hog business, and you can see how quickly the industry grew. Each one of these is one of those hog operations. They went from just being a handful in the 1970s to having over 2,000 by 1997. Now you'll notice, you might ask yourself, why stop at 1997, which is 25 years ago? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. But the world froze in 1997 for a reason that I'll explain. But by the time the world froze, again, these were everywhere, and particularly in this area down here, which is centered on four counties, Duplin County being the highest density. Now, there was a constituency of people. I said Wendell Murphy was basically everyone's hero. That was true for virtually everyone, but there was one constituency that was never asked what they thought about Wendell Murphy's grand vision and about the way that tobacco was transplanted into the hog business. Those were the neighbors of the hog operations. People who lived next door to these former tobacco lands, these shots were taken, they were showed in court in the third federal trial. This is a community called the artist community. And you can see how these folks live right next door to the cannon. And the way that this hog farmer, who actually, it turns out he owns lots of hog farms, he's not a family farmer, uh, didn't really care about shooting that waste. I mean, look at this. This is a giant spray field, and it actually extends much farther to the other side. But here he is, that cannon shooting the waste directly at these people's homes. Now, you can imagine how they felt about this when this suddenly started happening. Now, there's a, something sort of unique about this constituency. Most of the neighbors are people of color. That's because, again, this is the Brightleaf Tobacco Belt, and right in its heart, a lot of the folks who live there are black. They are descendants of the folks who were enslaved on the former tobacco plantations. If you are black in North Carolina, you are 54% more likely to live within three miles of one of these industrial hog operations. And if you happen to live in the circle, it's more like three times more likely to live within three miles of an industrial hog operation than a non-Hispanic white person. There are nine million market hogs in the state of North Carolina for 10 million people. So basically, virtually everyone could have a Wilbur if they wanted it. In Duplin County, the density is so high that you have two million market hogs in just this one county alone. The red dots are the industrial hog operations. The purple dots are industrial poultry operations. So you can see that this is quite an agricultural area. But there are, there's one hog, or sorry, 35 hogs for every human being in that part of the world. 
Wendell Murphy got quite rich as the industry exploded. He landed on the cover of Forbes magazine in 1997, having become a billionaire on low tech with his cute little pink pig. And we'll see later on, sadly, the way they are treated. They don't stay cute, little, or pink. Uh, in 2000, Smithfield Foods, which was the largest packer, they had the largest slaughterhouse, still do, in the country, in Tar Heel, North Carolina, took over and bought out Wendell Murphy. So Joe Luter, who was Wendell Murphy's counterpart, but on the packing side, took over. Smithfield became the largest packer and producer of hogs in the entire world. But Joe Luter was much like Wendell Murphy. He believed, well, you know, in the American love of supersizing things. So, you know what? He figured there's one more final frontier. The final frontier of hogs is China. So China is the world's largest consumer of pork. And yet, because of its export rules, its import rules, uh, Smithfield could not sell to the Chinese market. Unless he did a deal, unless Joe Luter could do a deal with this guy, Wan Long, uh, who was basically his counterpart in China. So his thought was, and this is back in the early 2000s, we'll do a merger, we'll, we'll bring together our two powerhouses, and we'll open up the Chinese market to Smithfield ham and Smithfield bacon. In the end, China flipped the script. And in 2013, no merger was ever done until 2013 when Smithfield came by then. Joe Luter had stepped down from the CEO, uh, CEO's chair, and Larry Pope had taken over the corner office. But Wan Long came in in 2013 with a buyout offer of Smithfield of $7 billion, which was 30% above the market capitalization or stock value of the company. He did that with help from the Bank of China owned by the government. They gave him a $4 billion loan, which was approved in one day. Now, you imagine what kind of political power has to come to bear to approve a $4 billion loan in a day. That never happens in the United States, I can tell you that. Now, the question was, and this, there was actually a hearing in the US Senate in which senators grilled Larry Pope and said, hey, don't you think there's something sort of sketchy going on here. They're paying 30% above the market cap of the company, and they got this sweetheart loan from the government-owned Bank of China. Do you think maybe this is kind of you know, being governed by or driven by the ghost in the machine, the Communist Party of China? Now, Larry Pope kind of chuckled, and there's a video of it, and it's actually kind of humorous. He was like, ah. You know, I, I haven't seen any communists. I don't know exactly what you're talking about. And ultimately, the Senate said, you know what? We're OK with it. I mean, we'll grill him. And at the end of the day, though, Americans love mergers because you generally mergers lower the consumer price. And we would love to have cheaper pork. Now, what's curious is that a couple of years later, a journalist got an amazing interview with Wan Long's son at the headquarters of Shuang Wei, which is now WH Group, that took over Smithfield in Hong Kong, overlooking the Victoria Harbor. And the journalist asked him questions of Wan Long's son about where the money came from and how the CCP was involved. And ultimately, what he admitted was, yeah, actually, the CCP was the driving force behind this acquisition. Because in the last five-year plan, which came out in 2012, the government of China said, you uh, Chinese investors need to buy agricultural land and technology. And Smithfield had some really great tech. And, and Smithfield also had something really curious. Smithfield had the benefit of a very low regulatory environment in North Carolina, where China could grow hogs cheaper in North Carolina than it could grow in China, because spray fields are not permitted by environmental regulations in mainland China. In 2013, Smithfield went global, $7 billion buyout. The neighbors, well, 
they had to live with this. But they did fight back. They tried, at least. This is Elsie Herring. She is one of my favorite of the neighbors. In the end, there were about 500 of them that came together to bring these lawsuits that I wrote about in Wastelands. Elsie was a really fascinating person. So she grew up in this little house built by her father in 1921. She was the 15th of 15 children. And basically all of her uh, siblings, and she ultimately, left Eastern North Carolina in the 1960s and 70s because there really wasn't any place for them. She's you know, a black person of modest means. Uh, she really wanted to do something with her life. And so she moved to New York. And she actually, with a high school education, was able to get jobs in the business district. She walked across the Brooklyn Bridge every morning and went to work in the financial sector and, and was actually very successful. She worked hard. She built herself a nest egg. And then when she came home in the early 1990s because her mother, Beulah, by then was in her 90s. And Beulah was too old to care for herself. Beulah was also too old to care for Jesse. Jesse was Elsie's uh, immediately older brother, the 14 to 15, and he had Down syndrome. So Elsie came home to a world in the early 90s that looked the same as the world she had left for the most part except their, the neighbor had built one of these hog operations right next door. You'll see this tree line over here. This didn't exist. This was put in by the industry. But ultimately, there was a spray field right over here. And you know, Elsie didn't think anything of it. I mean, hogs had been around forever. Her family had had a hog's die. It was not near the house. But they, you know, it was their breakfast bacon. It was their holiday ham. She didn't think anything of you know, a hog farmer starting a hog operation next door until one day, the hog farmer brought out one of those giant cannons, the Jurassic size sprinkler, and put it right next door, right over here. So Elsie and her mother Beulah and her, her brother Jesse were sitting on that porch. And this is, if you've been, well, you guys live in Texas, you know how it gets in the summertime. These folks don't have air conditioning. It was super hot. And basically, the only relief from the heat was to, st to sit on the porch. You open up the windows, well, you know, he gets in, it's hot inside the house, you come outside, and you sit on the porch. As soon as that cannon started spraying, I mean, the wind caught it. And you can imagine, actually, you can't imagine until you smell it. And that's something I cannot give you. <laughs> but I've had it my, my, myself. And I can tell you, it is an unforgettable experience. And yet, you would love to forget it. You would love for it never to have happened. That stuff gets in your nose, it's acrid, it burns the inside of your nose, it gets in your throat and makes you feel like you're choking. You can't get away from it because it's literally the air you're breathing. They ran inside, closed all the doors and windows, couldn't get away from it. It was inside, it was on their clothes. And then Elsie had an experience that she described in many settings over the course of her years of activism. She looked up at the roof and realized that she was hearing the sound of droplets falling upon her mother's roof like rain. Droplets of intense hog waste. Now, Elsie, unlike a lot of her neighbors, did not think to herself, well, I guess, you know, the hog farmer's white, I'm black, I don't have a lot of political power, I'm just, you know, I'm going to have to accept this. A lot of her neighbors who had stayed down east through these years had grown very accustomed to being uh, disenfranchised. They didn't like it, but it, there was a very real social cost to pushing back. And they had borne that cost over the course of generations. Elsie had more or less conquered the white man's world in New York. And she was like, you know what? There's no way I'm letting this happen to my mother. She's in her 90s. She's lived on this land her whole life. Her father, my grandfather, was enslaved on this land. And, she had, and he had acquired the 80 acres on which this house was built during Reconstruction. There is no way that I'm going to allow this to continue. So what did she do? She reached out to her local officials. And the local officials, well, the first local officials she talked to was the, the sheriff. He was a hog farmer. He didn't help. She went to the local soil and water people. Hey, look, they're spraying waste. 
It's despoiling the, you know, the land. It's probably running off into the rivers and streams. She was ahead of her time. They said, oh, you know, they're permitted. They can do it. And ultimately, she realized they were also in the back pocket of industry. She reached out to the state, to the governor. She reached out to the governor's office, the attorney general's office. And they came back and said, you know, sorry, there really isn't anything we can do. Again, they're permanent. This is all very legal. She wrote letters to the NAACP and Jesse Jackson thinking, hey, somebody will see this environmental racism, see that people like me are being disproportionately impacted. And unfortunately, none of them came to her aid. There literally was only one person with any power in North Carolina who came to the aid of Elsie Herring, and she was maybe the least likely person to do it. Her name was Cindy Watson. She was, in 1994, a new representative in the State House for the county of Duplin, in which Elsie lived, that really highly dense uh, area of hogs. Cindy was a Gingrich-style Republican. She had, run, she had run a campaign that was very pro-business, very, you know, hey, take government's hands off of uh, industry. And, and ultimately, you know, she had won in 1994, rode into power on the, the wave that swept Gingrich, Newt Gingrich, and the Republicans into power in Congress in 1994. But Cindy was a little bit different in the sense that while she really believed in capitalism and very, very much in, in uh, business, she also cared a lot about her constituents. So one day, Elsie called her office and said, hey, uh, would you mind coming to my property? I'd like to show you a problem that I'm having with my neighbor. And I think it might be affecting a lot of people in our area. And Cindy actually took her up on that. She drove down uh, from you know, the state house in Raleigh, drove down to Elsie's property, and stood on that property line right there where the trees are, and out came the hog farmer, his wife and his son. And they started shouting at Elsie in Cindy's presence. In fact, using racist language, calling Elsie, I won't say it, the N-word, in front of Cindy Watson, their representative, which is kind of surreal, can you imagine? And in fact, Cindy stopped them and said, look, <laughs> I mean, Listen, I've never heard anybody speak like this in my presence, not since I've been a representative. I don't know what your problem is, but I don't want to put you out of business. I don't want to take your livelihood. I know what you're scared of. I don't want to shut you down, and I don't think Ms. Herring is asking for that. But see that gun? And she pointed over at the cannon, which was lying in the field. See that gun over there? I've been in office for just a few months, and I've seen that that gun is dividing families setting brother against brother, and creating problems in our community, the likes of which I have never seen. We've got to find a solution that both keeps you in business, the hog farmer, and also takes care of Miss Herring and doesn't allow your waste to be blown onto her mother's roof. Cindy went back to the state house in Raleigh. Imagine what happened. Silence, absolutely nothing. And in fact, she knocked on every door. She talked to everyone. She said, do we not see that there's a huge problem down east? We've got all of these 2,000 hog farms. They're all spraying on their neighbors. Like, I've got personal testimony about what it's, what it's causing. There are some health effects. I mean, actually, there were epidemiologists who were doing studies showing the health effects of living next door, the increased respiratory problems, the hypertension, the, the mood disorders. I mean, there are all sorts of bad things that happen when you live next door to the, these, these industrial hog farms. And so Cindy was saying, look, we need to pay attention. We're the state house. We're the people's representatives. These are our constituents. Silence. Silence. Turns out the governor, at this time, Jim Hunt, had been Wendell Murphy's roommate at NC State. This is the way that you know politics happens in North Carolina, even sadly, even today. So there was a day that Cindy got pulled aside by a lobbyist, the chief lobbyist of the hog industry. And the lobbyist kind of took her into an alcove at the state house and said, you know, Representative Watson, he wasn't a bad guy. He was just doing his job. He said, I just want to tell you what's going on here. So everyone knows 
about the problem. There's not one person in this building who disagrees with you that it exists. But that industry pays me a lot of money to make sure that nothing happens. Nothing happens. That isn't a picture, sadly, of corporate capture of politics in America. I don't know what is. Cindy continued, despite knowing this, knocking on doors, got silence until one day in 1997, a hog farmer had a uniquely bad idea, and that was to put one of those giant spray fields right up the road from one of America's iconic golf resorts. So when you decide that you're going to spray up the road from Pinehurst, apparently the good old boys in North Carolina's legislature decide, oh, hey, we've got to do something about this. And so what happens? The golfers took on the pork producers. Who do you think won? The governor all of a sudden called Cindy Watson, the governor, the former roommate of Wendell Murphy, the godfather of hogs, and said, Representative Watson, you've been clamoring for a one-year moratorium on new hog farms with these lagoons and spray fields. I'll raise you to two years. And suddenly, everyone said yes, and it passed. And in fact, that moratorium became permanent. And that's why, if you remember that map, where in 1997, there were no more hog farms, that's why. But ask yourself, what happened to the legacy hog? And they were the ones that were causing the problem. And yet nobody in the state house wanted to say anything at all about what should happen to them. So they just went on spraying, went on causing the problem. No new hog farms with lagoons and spray fields after 97, but the existing ones, well, they just can just continue doing business. Until two years later, Mother Nature spoke. Hurricane Floyd dumped many, many feet of rain on eastern North Carolina. You can imagine what happened to those lagoons. They just flowed down the river, killing billions of fish, creating iconic images of hogs taking refuge on their barns like an island from the floodwaters. You here in Houston are familiar after Harvey with what happens when a hurricane basically camps out over a region for multiple days. Well, this is what happens. So in 1999, suddenly, the legislature, the governor, everybody admitted, we've got to do something about the existing lagoons and spray fields. What do you do with a, an intractable problem on the one hand, you have a constituency, and by now it wasn't just the people down east, it was all the people reading the newspaper and seeing these images, clamoring for reform. On the one hand, you have an a juggernaut of public opinion against this industry, and on the other, you have an industry that is pulling all the strings in the, leg the legislature and has all the economic and political power. What do you do? Well, you study the problem. So, the Attorney General of North Carolina, unlike some other states that actually enforce their laws and force Smithfield to change, the Attorney General of North Carolina did a deal with Smithfield and said, hey, if you put in $15 million to a fund, give the NC State scientists something to work with, and if they come up with some technology that can replace the existing lagoons and spray fields, you're gonna be obligated to implement that technology. And the good scientists at NC State did that. It took some years, but they produced something that was known as super soils, became known as Terra Blue. And yet, there was a loophole that was built into the Smithfield Agreement by the lawyer. I'm a lawyer, so I know why this happens. It's an undefined term. The obligation of the company to implement the new technology was contingent upon the new technology being economically feasible undefined, open to interpretation, subject to the decision of a subcommittee of people that the industry packed with their own folks. 
such that when the decision came down to it, economic feasibility was defined as no more costly than the existing medieval lagoons and spray fields. So the technology was scuttled. Smithfield and the industry had succeeded in buying more than a decade of peace for the measly sum of $25 million. Imagine that, almost $2 million a year for basically to get everybody to go away, the media to go away, the politicians to go away, the neighbors to go away, even after Hurricane Floyd, and nothing changed. So folks like Elsie Herring, they watched as their advocates disappeared. They watched as the industry torpedoed its own plan. And they realized there was only one place left where they could possibly ever get justice, and that would be the courthouse. But that would require a lawyer with the guts to take on the most powerful industry in the state. So they started knocking on doors and asking around. Guess what response they got? The same response Cindy Watson had gotten years before the state house. No lawyer wanted to touch this thing with a 10-foot pole. In fact, they all scurried the other direction. There was one lawyer, literally one lawyer, who, ever t who was willing to take on the industry. He was a former US senator, so he actually had some, a feel, anyway, of clout. But he had come back to a little town of Lillington in eastern North Carolina, and he brought suit against one hog farm, one case. Went to a jury, he lost. The industry nearly put him out of business. He had this story of one man against the machine. But frankly, for many years, no one wanted to hear that story. Until one day in 2013, a woman by the name of Mona Lisa Wallace came and knocked on his door and said, hey, Robert Morgan, Senator Morgan, would you tell me what happened when you sued the hog industry? Because I've heard from some people down east and I'm really concerned about the stories they're telling. And I've met with some of them and I'm bothered by what's happening, but I want to understand what happened to you. And he told her the story and he said, Mona, by this, he knew who she was. She came from the wrong side of the railroad tracks had basically built her law practice on uh, supporting the underdog, on taking on corporate Elias. By this point, she's very successful. Her daughter, one of her daughters is a lawyer in her firm. Another daughter is an environmental activist. She cares deeply about the environment. So Senator Morgan said to Mona, look, Mona, I don't think there's anybody else in this state who's gonna help these people out. So please, take the case. They need you, but count the cost. Because if you do, the industry will do everything in its power to bury you, just like they did to me. So Mona went home and had a conversation with her daughters and her husband, who's always been very close to the practice, though he's not a lawyer. And they had this fascinating conversation that I recount in the book in which they talked about, well, okay, so if we take this case, she's a plaintiff's lawyer, these people are not gonna pay us fees. We're gonna front all the money, not just, you know, we're basically not gonna get billable hours, we're not gonna get paid for it, but we're also gonna have millions of dollars in expenses going up against this multi-billion dollar Chinese-owned megalith. Like, if we go up against them, we are going to have endless fees, endless expenses, and it's gonna take five, seven, 10 years, who knows, before we ultimately get judgment. And how do we quantify the harm? It's not like wrongful death lawsuits where you can basically say, how much would this person have made if they'd stayed alive? You can quantify sort of pain and suffering, but nuisance? The right of people, of neighbors to live next door to a hog operation without having their use and enjoyment of their land unreasonably interfered with? Like, that's a mouthful. How are we gonna convince the jury that this is worth more than Nuisance money, basically, just a little bit of money. And if we get into a courthouse, we might actually win the moral argument and convince everybody that Smithfield is a terrible company and that they've been exploiting these people for a generation, but we might get no money at all for them, let alone 
any of our expenses paid back. They had this really heart-to-heart -heart conversation. But at the end of it, and I believe this because I've heard it from so many people from outside the family who know Mona. Mona stopped and said, look, you're all right. I mean, there are, there's a lot of risk here. There's a lot of downside. But this is my state, and I'm sickened by what's happening here. And if we don't do this, nobody else is going to. And so money be damned. Whatever happens, happens. We're just going to do this for the right reason. And that's from what I've heard and what I wrote in the book. I've heard this from so many people. That's the way she's always rolled. Even back in the day before she had a dime to her name, when she had multiple mortgages on her house, and when she, was, she told me the story of being a young lawyer with her two daughters in tow, where she was scrounging around the real estate office looking for deeds to keep the lights on before she was ever able to actually take down Duke Energy, which really launched her career. She decide, has always kind of rolled by this, what's the right thing to do? Let's do that. And the rest will follow. She ultimately took on claims of about 500, I mentioned this, 500 neighbors. There were many more neighbors who could have been part of the litigation, but they had to make some hard decisions about how to bring these lawsuits. A lot of people think, was it a class action? No, it was called a mass action, which is when you bring individual claims on behalf of individual clients, but a lot of different lawsuits together that look similar. So she brought 26 lawsuits on behalf of 26 different communities, 500 clients. Here's one neighborhood. You'll remember these folks from the, the photos that I showed of the neighbors with the cannon pointed at their, uh, their property. So you've got Jimmy Jacobs here, the neighborhood gardener. You've got uh, Joyce and Willie Messick. Joyce is a sort of Mother Teresa figure, takes care of everyone, including her hospice patients. And um, Willie, her brother, used to ride horses over where the hog farm is today. And of course, you can no longer do that. I love telling their story in the book. The Mona is always kind of rolled in, in the way that, like, I'm going to the best, so she got this National Geographic videographer to put the stories of these clients together. And one of the videos is really compelling. I just want to show you, I'll let Jimmy Jacobs tell you a little bit more about his experience in his own words. Mystery fog, probably the best description you could come up with. So the lawyers knew they would have compelling witnesses who could tell their story. But how do you convince a jury that something stinks other than through those sorts of stories? Video, audio does not capture smell. And so they had to find a substitute, and they did. There was a, a scientist who told them about a really interesting DNA molecule called pig tuback. It's a marker. It only exists in the gut of hogs. So if you find pig tuback anywhere, you know that it used to be attached to hog waste, hog feces. The feces disintegrates much faster than the DNA does, than the, than the pig tuback. And so they brought this to the jury. They thought, you know what, we'll go out and we'll test the neighbors, we'll test their homes, we'll test their kids' swing sets, we'll test their cars, we'll test inside their homes and we'll see if we find pig tuback. It was kind of a last ditch effort. I mean, how do we quantify this? How do we characterize it for the jury? And what they found is pig tuback everywhere. They even found it inside one woman's kitchen. 
on her countertop, on top of her uh, refrigerator next to a loaf of bread. And they showed pig to back to the jury using this animation. I remember when I saw it, I thought, my goodness, if that doesn't perfectly capture visually exactly what's been happening over all these years. They also went inside the barns the industry tried to keep them out. They desperately wanted no one to see what was happening inside the barns to the animals. And I don't mention a lot in the book about animal rights or about you know, dogs as sentient creatures, but I do mention this, and I didn't know it. I've got a dog at home. Do you? The average pig is smarter than the average dog. Can you imagine treating your beloved pet like this? Remember, these are pink pigs. There is no dirt inside a hog operation. What you see on the floor and on them is what comes out of them. And this was, it was this way in every barn. Even when the hog farmer had notice and in fact tried it, their best to clean all of their animals before the visit, they still looked like this. Something that Mike Kesky, so Mona hired brought in a trial lawyer, one of the best in the country, Mike Kesky, from Dallas, just right up the road, uh, to be the face of the neighbors in front of the jury. And Mike enjoyed uh, the opportunity to depose, take depositions of numerous of Smithfield's uh, executives, including a guy named Craig Westerbeek, who is the vice president of environmental and support operations. This is just one simple clip uh, that'll show you something unique or interesting about the industry and the way they think about this. So to set it up, for 30 minutes, Mike had asked Craig about all of the studies that have been done by Yale, by UNC Chapel Hill, by various other high-end institutions showing the link between the, or the health effects of hog waste exposure. What is it like for the neighbor's respiratory systems and their mental health and various in their hearts? And in fact, all these studies had shown that there are deleterious effects, that it's not a good thing health-wise to live next door to one of these things. So Mike then asked this question of Craig. Sir, can you mark around name for me a single scientific article published in the Journal of Medicine in 's approach to the issue for 30 years was to gaslight everyone, to deny the existence of what everyone could see and hear and smell and even taste. Over and over again, it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. They're lying to you. Well, thankfully the lawyers found a man who came in and told the truth. This man is a profile in moral courage Tom Butler is his name. He's a dear soul. He's in his 80s now. He is a hog farmer. He is the only hog farmer in all of North Carolina who is willing to turn on his own industry, even though it is still the way he makes his living, and tell the truth. He agreed, despite being terrified of doing it, to testify in all five federal trials. He was the anchor witness. He was the last person who spoke to the jury. And every time this man got up in front of the first trial, his bosses sat in the front row. Many growers, many of his uh, colleagues, hog farmers, sat behind him. The industry sat behind them. And he told the truth. He was asked simple questions. And he said, you know what? All of those neighbors, they're telling the truth. My neighbors came to me many years ago, and they asked me, could you do something about the fact that you're making our lives really difficult. Our kids are complaining. They're waking up at night. They're sneezing. They're coughing. They're getting asthma. Can you help? So Tom, being a man of great uh, concern and moral courage, decided to try to help on his own. He covered his lagoons with grant money. 
He went out and got loans. He told me he's going to die in the red. He's going to give his family farm, 100 years old, to his son in debt because the industry didn't help. They never helped when he went to them and said, we've got a problem. He's done it all himself, and he told this all to the jury. And you can imagine the effect that that had on 12 jurors five times sitting in the box. If you're interested in all of the nuances and, frankly, all of the drama, and there was so much drama in the story, you can read the book, and I encourage you. It was, it, it, it's a fun read. I wrote it like a novel, even though it's all true. People say it's actually a quick read, despite looking sort of thick. So I encourage you to read it, but I will say this about the end. The last refuge of a corporation is always, I mean, that's had some difficulties with juries, is the Court of Appeals, judges. If we find a legal technicality, we can overturn verdicts. And they were fortunate, because they, or at least they thought they were, because they drew a panel of three judges in the Fourth Circuit, two of whom were conservative lions. One, Harvey Wilkinson and the guy in the middle, had been shortlisted for the Supreme Court during George W. Bush's term. As a result, and both of the, those conservatives had written a lot about how business is unfairly criticized. Corporations are unfairly criticized by lawyers, especially trial lawyers in the court. And so there was a real concern. Are these guys going to throw out what happened with the juries? I was there in January of 2020, right before COVID hit. We were sitting in the blue courtroom, and, and Mike Heskey, the trial lawyer, turned to me, and he'd actually whispered right before the judges came out, I feel like one of those hogs going into the slaughterhouse. We all felt that way until Judge Wilkinson sat back in his chair and said this. What? And I'll just speak in a general manner of what troubled me. Um, in the, when you look at the complaint and you look at the trial, the hog farming here, it certainly provides me jobs in East and North Carolina. I mean, and I understand that, and it's very important to the economy of the um, of the eastern part of the state, and that's surely true, and, and it is important not only that, but to our, our national food supply. But it, it's harmful to the people who live nearby. It, 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 when you, you look at the amicus brief, look at the complaints, it's got to be environmentally harmful to the waterways and seeping into the water. Nobody wants to go to Flint, Michigan, tragedy down the road. And this can't be good for children's respiratory systems. Just, just these odors, you know, talking about wheezing and headaches and things like that. And, and the inhumanity to the animals and the um, fatality rate among the all of that, those are just animals and maybe some people think they're ugly and treat them the way we want, but it, you know, I, I just kept reading this case and I'm thinking to myself, you know, these are, if this were my property, I would be outraged at, at some of these conditions that were allowed to persist. And, and I think, you know, our less fortunate fellow citizens, they have property rights too. And many of the homes surrounding an operation of this sort, they don't go for a high price. So the people who live in them, you know, they have a right to good health. They have a right to their enjoyment of their property. But I never substitute that. And I, and I, and I just I thought, if this were some mansion 
It's a wild moment. I've been a lawyer for a long time, been a lot of courts, been in front of a lot of judges, and I can tell you, sadly, that in a lot of courtrooms, justice does not darken the doorway. A lot of other things do, a lot of other interests. But once in a while, in the American legal system, justice comes home, and it did in this case. And I was able and felt so fortunate to be able to tell the story and to write about it. So I encourage you, if you have time and interest, to take a look at this book. All of it's true, and these people truly do uh, deserve to have their story be told. Thank you so much. I realize I've taken up more time than I was allotted for my talk, so I don't know if, if you all need to, to scoot out and go somewhere else. Great, but I'll be around for Q&A. Thank you.